Jay Jermaine Bay with Elodian Morris Cranium. I'm Ted Carlin Robin. Uh, the acronym is ANPAC. I'm the Chief Judge of Consular Court. Uh, today is Class 51. Class 51. Uh, what did we learn in Class 50? Well, we were going over the blueprint. And what's the blueprint? The Moors don't realize it. But in 1952, the blueprint came out to help Moors to start understanding how to enforce our own treaties. But that blueprint also started to point out some of the flaws that the Moors were making, some of the misconcepts that Moors think in terms of how to enforce the Constitution of the United States of America. Is enforcing the Constitution of the United States of America a bad thing? No, it's just out of proper sequential order. So what did the ICJ say that the Moors had to do? We have to enforce what? Our treaty provisions. But in order to enforce treaty provisions, we needed a state. In order to have a state, you have to have a constitution. So we have to put things in proper sequential order, right? So what were we learning about the ICJ report that Moors have to really understand? If you're trying to play a politi political game of chess, then you still need chess pieces, right? Moors this entire time thought the chess pieces were really just our consanguinity, just our bloodline, and that we could write writs and affidavits and that was sufficient. Well, that was a misconcept. What did we need according to the ICJ? We needed states, constitution, treaty provision enforcement, and through those enforcement, how do we enforce all of that? Through consular court. And by that way, and that way only, right? That's what we're starting to find out, right? So as we continue with our class, we'll move on with class 51. As I said, we we'll always open up about the Constitution. This is AMPAC's Constitution. It's important to understand what the Constitution is all about. The Constitution is the first step in the triple principle. Where do you find a triple principle? In your own Morris Treaty. The Act of Algeceras, the 1906 preamble, talks about the triple principle, sovereignty and independence, integrity of domain, and economic liberty without any inequality. That's the triple principle. That's Dorothy's clicking her heels three times and returning back to Morocco, all right? So we'll talk about that a little bit more today. What is, what is the status of Moors in terms of being stateless versus being subject Moors or, or what we could call Moorish national? We'll talk about that a little bit more today, all right? So one of the things that I want to open up today about again is France versus United States of America, 1952. Like I said, it's a blueprint, right? It's starting to make us understand that the answer to the test has always been in our possession since 1952, at the very least, right? So we're still talking about, in this case, it's talking about Moroccan subjects, et cetera, Moroccan protégés. It's talking about stateless persons, right? So today I wanted to go over a little bit more about stateless persons because we're getting ready to start getting ready to uh, get into the Act of Algeciras, 1906, in terms of reading all 123 articles of that treaty, so we're building up, right? So I just want to go over, what, what is this about this stateless person? What is it about more subjects and more protégés, right? So let, let's talk about that a little bit more before we get into the Act of Algeciras of 1906, right? Because when we go over the Act of Algeciras of 1906, it's going to refer to Moors, Moorish government, but it's also going to keep referring to Moroccan subjects. So we're building up that way. By the time we read the Act of Algeciras of 1906, we have a basic understanding of who are they identifying as the parties, right? Okay. So as we learned in the Treaty of Madrid of 1880, Article 15, in its two sections, right? We got sec we got paragraph one and we've got paragraph two, right? So in paragraph one, it talks about any subject of Morocco who has been naturalized in a foreign country who shall return to Morocco, shall have to have him remain for a length of time equal to that which shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization, choose between entire submission to the laws of the empire and the obligation to quit Morocco, unless it shall be proved that his naturalization in a foreign country was obtained with the consent of the government of Morocco. You see that last sentence, Morris? Consent of the government of Morocco. In other words, Morris have to do what? Morris have to return to Morocco. Listen to me. Moroccan subjects have to return to Morocco and they have to get the consent 
of the, of the government of Morocco in order for them now to be a Moorish national. That must be understood. You have to return to Morocco in order for the government of Morocco to agree to the, your consent to pledge your allegiance to the government of Morocco. So all the Moroccan subjects have to return to Morocco. Well, what about Morocco? You have to now what? Consent to a government of Morocco, but more specifically, state government of Morocco, okay? Now, let's look at the board. So we got to break this down. I recognize Moore's a little confused about this stateless person and subject status, so let's, let's break it down a little bit more, okay? According to the Treaty of Madrid, Article 15, the Moroccan subject is naturalized in the treaties. Naturalized, right? Mm -hmm. But who is the Moroccan subject they're talking about in the treaty? Okay, let's use an example. The straw man, for example, e.g., for example, is Kendrick Johnson. We're using Kendrick Johnson's name as an example. And I, and I want to say, I, whoever Kendrick Johnson is out there in the empire, uh, I love you, brother. <laughs> We're just using your name as a placeholder, but hopefully you're tuning in. That way you can find out how to enforce your appellation as Kendrick Bay. All right, we'll talk about that today, okay? Let's start from the top. According to the Treaty of Madrid, Article 15, the Moroccan subject is naturalized, according to the treaty. Who is the Moroccan subject? The straw man, for example, Kendrick Johnson, is the Moroccan subject. Because Kendrick Johnson is still what? Kendrick Johnson still naturalized in the United States of America. He's still naturalized in the United States of America. Listen. Kendrick Johnson is naturalized and protected by the United States of America and the United States Treaty provisions. So Kendrick Johnson, the Moroccan subject, is protected by the foreign country. But this Treaty of Madrid gave the United States treaty rights to protect and hold on to Moroccan subject. That's paragraph two. Foreign naturalization heretofore acquired by subjects of Morocco according to the rules established by the laws of each country shall be continued to them as regards all its effects without any restrictions. So what's, who is it being continued to? It's continued to the United States of America without any restrictions. What's, what's being continued to them? The status of naturalized Moors. It's continued to the United States of America without any restrictions. The ICJ backed this up, right? Mm -hmm. We read the summary page, sections two and three talked about the United States of America hold on to civil and criminal jurisdiction. As long as Moors were still what? Naturalized, still in naturalization status. This is why the ICJ ruled in the favor of the United States of America, right? Saying the United States of America could hold on to the Moors with any restrictions because Moors had failed to return. So the Moroccan subjects had an obligation to do what? Return to Morocco and to do what? Consent to the government of Morocco. And since we didn't do that, we still remain in a naturalization status, and the United States of America could hold on to us with any restrictions. So let's get back over here. Without, yes, without any restrictions. Thank you, look. So who is the Moroccan subject? It's a straw man, right? The straw man, for example, Kendrick Johnson, is still a naturalized citizen under that straw man name. And he's protected by the United States of America, United States Treaty provisions. What treaty provisions? This treaty, as well as the Act of Algeceres, Articles 101 and 102. Okay? The International Court of Justice in, entitled the United States to have civil and criminal jurisdiction over stateless Moors. Now, what makes Kendrick Johnson potentially stateless? It's because Kendrick Johnson now just woke up and realized he's a Moor. 
Kendrick Johnson, quote unquote, is a black amour. He don't want to be black no more. Now he wants to be a more. So Kendrick Johnson still has the legal name of Kendrick Johnson on the record with the United States of America. We refer, refer to it as the straw man, right? So Kendrick Johnson to them is black man, right? But now Kendrick Johnson, no, 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 no. I ain't black. I'm a more. Okay, sounds good, Kendrick Johnson. What did he do about it? He says, I'm going to change my appellation, or should I say correct my appellation, and become Kendrick Bay. Right? So let's learn about Kendrick Bay as well. Because now we're talking about two different names. We're talking about Kendrick Johnson. And then we're going to start learning about Kendrick Bay in just a moment. Okay? So watch this. We're going to go back to this game. So the ICJ entitled the United States to have civil and criminal jurisdiction over stateless moors because Kendrick Bay just woke up and he says, I'm not a citizen of the United States no more. I'm a moor. Right? Proclaiming his nationality like he should, right? But watch this. This is where Moors get confused. I'm going to point this out. Who are the stateless Moors? I just identified who's the Moroccan subjects. Now let's talk about who are the stateless Moors who claim they're not Moroccan subjects. Listen. Kendrick Bay, right? Because now Kendrick Bay is saying now he's Kendrick Bay, X Rail Kendrick Johnson, right? Isn't that what we were taught? X Rail Kendrick Johnson is straw, right? So it's Kendrick Bay, X Rail Kendrick Johnson. That's how we've been taught to write, okay? Listen. So who are the stateless Moors? Kendrick Bay is stateless because he never pledged his consent and allegiance to a competent Moorish state government according to the treaty instructions. The treaty instruction says, Kendrick Johnson, who's the subject of Morocco, the Moroccan subject, who wants to be Kendrick Bay, had an obligation, obligation to what? Return to Morocco. How does he return to Morocco? With the consent of the government of Morocco. And how does he pledge his consent on the record? called an application. And what is that application? That's called what? Open allegiance back to said state. That's him now being on the record of a Moorish state government. So when I ask the Moors, what's the name of your Moorish state government? And you can't tell me? Immediately, you just, by default, just told me you're still a Moroccan subject that has not returned to Morocco with an application that you fill it out in order to now be a more and more national by consent to the government of Morocco. Listen, because we're going to go through all this again. Kendrick Bay. Okay, so let's start all over. Okay. Kendrick Johnson, ex rail Kendrick Bay is stateless because he never pledged his consent and allegiance to a competent Moorish state government. Listen, Kendrick Bay is an, is an alien. What's an alien? His, his appellation. I'll explain. Kendrick Bay is an alien until a Moorish state government recognizes its lawful status with the Moorish state government. I'm speaking very slowly, right? So what's happening? We got to explain this. Why did I say Kendrick Bay is an alien? Because Kendrick Bay never pledged his allegiance to a Moorish government. So Kendrick Bay as a name is not on the record with any state on planet Earth. Kendrick Bay, based upon his divinity, he had a right to his own self-determination. He determined that he wanted to change his name. He wanted to correct his name to what? Kendrick Bay. So he went from Kendrick Johnson, x rail Kendrick Bay. But listen, Kendrick Johnson, Kendrick Johnson was under the protection of the United 
speaks. So Kendrick Johnson technically isn't speechless because Kendrick Johnson is on the record with who? The states of the United States. Guess who's not on the record with any state on planet Earth? Kendrick Beck. So if I ask Kendrick Beck, what's the name of your state provincial government in Morocco, more than likely he can't tell me. If I ask Kendrick Beck, can you provide me with some documentation of your state identification card that was authorized and given to you by the Moorish state? He couldn't give it to me. If I ask Kendrick Beck, who was the name of the prime minister or the wazir of your state government? He couldn't tell me. If I ask Kendrick Beck, who was the name of the council court judge of your government that was elected and was sworn in? What's his name or her name? He probably couldn't tell me. If I ask Kendrick Bay that your constitution, was it written by Moors? Was it ratified, deposited with the United Nations Secretariat Charter, Article 102? He probably couldn't tell me. What's happening? Kendrick Bay is an alien, excuse me, is an alien according to international law. According to international law, Kendrick Bay does not exist because he's not on the record with any state on planet Earth. So when the colonists tell you, well, we don't recognize that name you're using of Kendrick Bay, but they'll tell you they do recognize who? Kendrick Johnson. The colonists are trying to tell us the answers to the test. They don't have to recognize the Kendrick Bay. Why? Why? Because a more state never recognized Kendrick Bay. So when they ask you, okay, you say you're Kendrick Bay, prove it. Where's your state ID? Where's the birth record from that Moorish state? Where's your oath and allegiance to that Moorish state? And where's the consul that's supposed to be representing you at this time? And that consul is the competent authority of that state because that consul got elected in by his constituents. And they took their oath and allegiance and they got sworn in by a judge, Morris judge. Then that competent authority that represents that Morris state can come down and represent Kendrick Bay. Because that competent Morris official has governmental credentials that say they're on the record of a Morris state government. So all the Moors out there, especially young Moors, you gotta understand, yeah, your divinity said you can be Kendrick Bay. But according to the law of your own Moorish treaties, it said you had to be Kendrick Bay of Morocco. And Morocco is defined by a government of Morocco. Not just your divinity saying through arbitrary and capricious nationality cards saying, well, I'm a Moor. They already know you're Moor. By your prima facie, you're not telling the colonists anything they don't know. But since you can't Prove that you're Kendrick Bay that merely put you on the status of what? Stateless, and they put you on the status of what? A Moroccan subject. And since you're a Moroccan subject that failed to return to Morocco to get the consent of a Moroccan government, then they automatically know you fall underneath paragraph number two. And the ICJ was taking a look at this. Moors got to understand in 1952 is the blueprint to tell Moors we were failing our own Moors treaties. The Treaty of Madrid is a Moors treaty that put Moors in a particular status. This must be understood. Let's take it from the top. According to the Treaty of Madrid, Article 15, the Moroccan subject is naturalized according to the Treaty of Madrid. Who is the Moroccan subject? The straw man, for example, Kendrick Johnson. Kendrick Johnson is naturalized and protected by the United States and United States treaty provisions. Our own Moors treaties are protecting him in a foreign country. The ICJ entitled the United States to have civil and criminal jurisdiction over stateless Moors that did not follow the instructions. Who are the stateless Moors? Kendrick Bay is stateless because he never pledged his consent and allegiance 
to a competent Moorish state government, according to our treaties. Kendrick Bay is an alien until a Moorish state government recognizes its lawful status with the Moorish state government. Those are the treaty provisions of Article 15. So what have Moors been doing wrong? We thought that we could just say because of our divinity, we could just send rich affidavits to the colonists. We were doing that out of order. We have been out of order. Why? Because our own Morris treaties of the Act of Algeciras, 1906, the preamble says, what was the proper sequential order? The first order was what? Sovereignty and independence. What is sovereignty and independence? State. And you can't have a state without a constitution. That was the first box we were supposed to check. I will remind you that the Sultan of Morocco had to follow the instructions of the Act of Algeciras of 1906. And what did he do? He enacted a constitution which identified his fixed territory in Morocco. He proclaimed to have an organic state as the king of his own fixed territory in Morocco. And Moors will have to do the same thing. So in the meantime, young Moors, listen to me. Your Kendrick Bay is an alien. It has no judicial authority whatsoever because the only way that Kendrick Bay as an appellation can have authority, it must be backed by the officials of a state. And that's the only way Kendrick Bay can exist on planet Earth. Every national on planet Earth gets their identification card from their state, which allows them to do business all around the world. The more the Northwest of Mexico are the only people on planet Earth with a nationality card saying it's sufficient. That makes us incompetent, and it means we're not following our own instructions of our own treaties. Let's continue. Stateless persons. Stateless persons. This is seventh, seventh edition. You won't find it in the fourth. Seventh edition. It immediately goes into international law, period. Period. So now we got to follow your brick road, right? So we got to find out what is stateless persons as it relates to international law, right? Fourth edition, mother. International law, the law which regulates the intercourse of nations, the law of nations, one kent common, one and four, the customary law which determines the rights and regulates the intercourse of independent states in peace and war. Stop. Thank you. So stateless persons, okay. This person is about international law, right? International law, fourth edition, the law which regulates the intercourse of nations. The law of nations. So it mentions this word nations twice. So we're following your brick road, right? So stateless person said international law, so we all start using what? Discernment, right? For instance, we're going backwards, right? They're telling you go look up words, right? So it's about nations, right? It's about the law of nations. So we're going to look up nations here in a minute, right? It's about what? Customs of law. What's the customary law? Your treaties. So the law, the law of nations is about the customary law of your treaties. The customary law which determines the rights and regulations, the intercourse of independent states. So international law is about nations, customary law, and independent states. Let's go back to stateless persons. So they tell you right at the top, you're a stateless person in international law because you don't have what? A state. And you're not following the instructions of 
customary law. Because you don't understand the definition of state and you don't understand the definition of nation. Let's look up nation. Nation, a people or aggregation of men existing in the form of an organized general society, usually inhabiting a distinct portion of the earth. Stop. So a nation is about the people. The people is about the nation. Hmm. I wonder when we saw that Try, type of phrase. Okay. Watch this. Definition of state. A state, now, person, place, or thing, that's what state is. Montevideo Treaty of 1939 says state is what? A person, right? So, state, now, person, place, or thing, is about the people. The people is about the state. Oh, okay. So they talk about people and the state, and all of a sudden you go over nation. It's about what? The people. The people is about the nation. Because the people is about the state. State and nation is the same. It's about the customary law of the nation and following the customary law of international law. And international law is your treaties. What else is international law? Constitutions. And constitutions are paramount. What else does it say about a nation? Well, it says the people, aggregation of men, existing in the form of an organized jural society. What's an organized jural society? That's your triple principle, right? Right? Sovereignty and independence, right? Integrity of domain. How do you maintain the integrity of domains? That's your courts. That's your law. The only way to enforce your laws is to enforce it through the courts. In order to wait for the courts to have anything to now preside over, that law had to come from who? The legislative branch and the executive branch of your government. The courts are no good without enforcing the laws of the state. So the jural, organized jural society is your three branches of government that maintains the integrity of domain. But you can't maintain the integrity of domains, domains without the first box, which is what? Sovereignty and independence. Listen. Usually inhabiting a distinct portion of the earth. What is distinct portion? That's the fixed territory. That's the Montevideo Treaty of 1933, Article 1. Section 8 says what? Permanent population, fixed territory, a government, and the ability to get into trade and relations with other states, right? Article 1, Treaty of Montevideo. Article 1, the state as a person of international law. So international law, stateless person, was about international law, and stateless people under international law didn't have a what? State. See, we follow y'all brick road. The state as a person of international law should possess the following qualification. So Moors have to do what? Possess the following qualifications. Under what? International law. But we learn that international law also defines stateless person. Following me? So the state as a person of international law should possess the following qualifications of what? A, a permanent population. That's the Moors, right? B, a defined territory. And C, a government. D, capacity interrelations with other states. What type of relations? Oh, okay, you're trying to deal with the United States? Well, you can't deal with the United States through recent affidavits. You have to deal with the United States through what? A state. What type of state? A state that has a government. A, what, what, and the government is located where? In a defined territory called your state dominions of your constitution. Because in international law, it's all about states. Let's continue. So in international law, it's about nations, 
customary law in independent states. Okay? And we'll look at the definition of nation that talked about the people of the nation because the people are part of a state. Then it talks about an organized rural society. What's that? A state. And having a distinct portion of the earth. What distinct portion? The state. Let's continue. Mother, speaking. Speaking the same language, using the same customs, possessing historic continuity, and distinguished from other like groups by their racial origin and characteristics, and generally, but not... Okay, just a moment. Roll on down. All right, here, here we go. Generally, but not necessarily, living under the same government and sovereignty. Okay, so nation is about what? A government and sovereignty. Wait a minute, the triple principle, first box said a state was what? Sovereignty and independence. That's what creates the government. Nation, we're talking nation. Okay, mother. Besides the element of autonomy or self-government, that is, the independence of the community as a whole from the interference of any foreign power in its affairs or any subjection to such power, it is further necessary to the constitution of a nation that it should be an organized general society, that is, both governing its own members by regulate, regular laws and defining and protecting their rights and respecting the rights and duties which attach to it as a constituent member of the family of nations. Such a society, says Vatel, Vatel, has her affairs and her interests. She deliberates and takes resolutions in common, thus becoming a moral person who possesses an understanding and will, protect, and will peculiar to herself and is susceptible of obligations and rights. Okay, what do we learn? So the nation is talking about the state. Then they go into nation to kind of break it down and give you a little bit more insight. Listen. Besides the element of autonomy, so how can you have autonomy? Where's autonomy? You have to have a state, an independent state in order to have autonomy. You have to disconnect from the jurisdiction of the United States of America. You can no longer be what? A Moroccan subject, right? You have to now be a Moorish national of what? an autonomous state that's self-governing. Isn't that what the Treaty of Madrid said? Article 15 is about a Moorish government. Take it from the top. Besides the element of autonomy of self-government, that is, the independence of the community as a whole from the interference of any foreign power, that's the United States of America, and its affairs of any subjection to such power, it is further necessary to the constitution of a nation. So a nation needs what? A constitution. You see what we're learning on the word nation? Why are we looking up nation? Because we looked up international law. Why are we looking up international law? Because we're looking up stateless person, and stateless person said international law, period. It's trying to tell you something. Go look up international law. See what we're learning? So they're saying stateless people intentionally because you're simply stateless. It's just not some frivolous word that you're throwing around. They're giving you the answers to the test. If you want your autonomy, then you need a state. And then the state has to be self-governing, which means you got to have a real government. And how do you have a real government? Ballots, elections. You pick your public officials to handle the affairs of your state. And your state becomes autonomous away from the United States of America. That's why the Treaty of Madrid said we have to return to Morocco. What are you returning to? A Moorish state government. And the Moorish state government tells you you are Kendrick Bay. You don't get to say you're Kendrick Bay. The Moorish state government tells you you're Kendrick Bay. And until then, you're an alien because Kendrick Bay don't exist nowhere on any competent state authorities registrar. It's an alien if it's not registered with a Moorish state 
government. Let's continue from the top. Besides the element of autonomy of self-government, that is, the independence of the community as a whole from the interference of any foreign power in its affairs of any subjection to such powers, it is further necessary to the constitution of a nation that it should be an organized general society, that is, both governing its own members. Stop. The more state government is supposed to be governing the Moors. But right now, Moors aren't governing Moors. Moors are so busy only dealing with the colonists, we're not even governing each other. We're not putting in any type of solidarity. There's no uniformity. We're not holding Moors accountable to law right now, are we? No. We only want to tell the colonists what they're entitled to and what they're supposed to do doing for us. But what are Moors doing to other Moors in terms of keeping them accountable to Moroccan law. Both governing its own members by regular laws and defining and protecting their rights. Moors got to protect their own rights. You can't wait for the United States to protect your rights. You're supposed to be protecting your own rights. The only way to do that is through a state and Respecting the rights and duties which attach to it as a constitute, co constituent member of the family of nations. Such a so society, says Patel, has her affairs and her interests. She deliberates and takes resolutions in common, thus becoming a moral person. What becomes the moral person? Huh? The state. Who is the moral person? Okay. The state is a person in international law. The moral person is the state. Because we're looking at what? Nation. Nation's about the state. Right? Okay, let's continue. Now today, I'll present some notes. These are handwritten notes. That way I can start talking to the Moors about our mission and vision. Especially the young boys, young boys, especially young boys. It's time for us to start moving the ball forward. It's time for us to stop procrastinating. It's time for us to get off the treadmill of doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. The International Court of Justice in the case known as France versus United States of America 1952 has given us the blueprint. It's time for more to follow the instructions. What instructions? The instructions of your own Moorish treaties. Those are the instructions. Your Moorish treaties, treaties is the international law. Moorish constitutions is the international law. And you will remain stateless and a Moroccan subject until you return to Morocco. How do you return to Morocco? A competent Moorish state officer has to sign off on your consent to pledge your allegiance to the state. That's how you become a, a Moorish national of a state. Those are the instructions. The Act of Algeciras, 1906, Articles 120 to 123, gave all the Moors instruction. You needed legislation. What legislation? Constitution law of what? State. And you had to do what? Ratification, depository, and then what? Promulgate. What is promulgate? Your United Nations notice that you're on the record. That's all you got to do. And then you do after that, you get to work. You enforce. The Treaty of Montevideo of 1933 enforced all 16 
of those generalized provisions. It gives you the basic instructions. Why am I telling you about that treaty? Because the United States of America ratified and deposited that treaty. They understand the obligations they have to Moors that they can't supervene the impossibility of performance of our Moors treaties and our Moors constitutions. They already know this. The ICJ already came out a report and gave it a final decision that Moors get to maintain their rights without anybody's permission on planet Earth. So these are some of my notes, okay? A call for more statehood, solidarity, and competency. All right? Question. How can Moors establish solidarity, uniformity, and accountability amongst our communities and achieve our ultimate mission and vision to uplift fallen humanity for ourselves and for the following generations of Moors states Moorish nationals, and Moorish government officials. First, we must stop being stateless people and eventually recognize that claiming arbitrary and capricious, self-executing powers and self-appointment of unofficial government titles. So we start from here. First, we must stop being stateless people and eventually recognize that claiming arbitrary and capricious self-executing powers and self-appointment of unofficial government titles is not the solution to our problem. Because in fact and truth, stateless Moors do not have an organic state backing their sovereign authority. Second, respectfully speaking, every Moor must cease and desist with the inaccurate pretense that enforcing the Constitution of the United States of America or enforcing the Constitution of the United States is in fact and truth a misconcept regarding competent remedy. Wherefore, the United States Constitution, excuse me, the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the United States is not the appropriate remedy according to Moore's treaties and pursuance to the findings of the ICJ case of France versus the United States of America, 1952. Third, the International Court of Justice, ICJ, in 1952, has made it overwhelmingly clear that stateless Moors are under the civil and criminal jurisdiction of the United States and the United States of America. Fourth, a Moors nationality card is further proof that Moors are stateless because the card was not issued by a competent, organic Moorish state that has been ratified, deposited, and promulgated in pursuance to Moore's treaties. Fifth, Moore's must become competent in conformity to the supreme law of the land. Sixth, Moore's have been in breach of their own Moore's treaties because we haven't been in conformity of the instructions set forth since 1787 and 1836 in 1880, in 1906, nor in conformity of the Treaty of Montevideo Customary Norms of Statehood, 1933, nor in conformity to the United Nations Charter of 1945, Article 73, nor in conformity of the ICJ Statutes of 1946, nor in conformity to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1946, nor in conformity to the ICJ case of France versus the United States of America, 1952. <clears throat> Nor have Moors been in conformity of Resolution 1514, Decolonization of Peoples, 1960. Nor have the Moors been in conformity of the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations of 1961. Nor have the Moors been in conformity of the Vienna Convention on the Constant Relations of 1963 nor have the Moors been in conformity of the Vienna Convention of the Laws of Treaties of 1969, nor have the Moors been in conformity of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, 2007, Article 5, nor have the Moors been in conformity of international law, just cogents, nor have the Moors been in conformity of urban office principles, nor have the Moors been in conformity of constitutional principles that the good brother Drew Ali, 
trying to get incompetent Moors to simply understand how the other nations on planet Earth protect their sovereign birthrights through civics and statehood. And lastly, nor have the Moors been in conformity as binding on the consular courts as long as the execution of statehood was being exercised and enforced against the United States and the United States of America. The Moors have been delaying their own justice. It's time for Moors to start following the instructions. There's so many opportunities for Moors to get back in statehood if we stop trying to enforce the Constitution of the United States of America. That is a local statute of the colonists. Everything I just read to you is about international law. Let's continue. Seven. Taking into note of law and history, the empire flag of Morocco is absent of a central government. But that does not mean the treaties are not in full force. It only means that there isn't a competent central Moorish government sitting in the empire chairs at this time. The greater interest of the empire will be satisfied by a central governing body as soon as possible. Keep in mind, in 1956, the Sultan of Morocco vacated the empire's central government in an act known as a German, Sinadia means Latin without day, without assigning a day for further meeting or hearing. A legislative body adjourns Sinadia when it adjourns without appointing a day on which to appear or assemble again. So what happened? The Sultan of Morocco in 1956, when he declared his independence, he vacated the central government that was overseeing the government of the entire empire. He left the seats vacant. That doesn't mean the empire doesn't exist because the treaties are still in existence. It just means now that the Sultan turned king is now only ruling over his fixed territory known as the Kingdom of Morocco, and the Kingdom of Morocco as an organic state is in the Empire of Morocco. But the king of the Kingdom of Morocco is no longer governing the affairs of the empire. He is now in the status of placeholder, where he now has a limited, limited authorization to oversee the treaties. But he doesn't have an absolute government status to oversee the treaties because the treaties technically are Moorish treaties. Okay, let's continue. The Sultan, the Sultan, adjourned the empire central government, Sinadia, allegedly on March 2nd, 1956. That's when he signed the Sultan signed an agreement with France that way France would dissolve the French the, uh, Treaty of Fairs of 1912. So the Treaty of Fairs of 1912 got dissolved when the Sultan signed the agreement with France and then the Sultan became king only of his little tiny state in Africa, i.e. Akibalan, all right? So he vacated the seat of the empire, okay? Right here, the Sultan. The Sultan turned king, went on to establish an organic independent state known as the Kingdom of Morocco, officially on December 7, 1962, and promulgated on December 14, 1962. So what did he do with the promulgation? That was his constitution. He put on the record with the United Nations Secretariat, Article 102. All right, that's promulgation. He gave notice that he finally had an active constitution, okay? However, however, it's important to note that the king of Morocco's organic state was accepted by the General Assembly members 
of the United Nations in December 1956, which is six years before they had a promulgated constitution. So you got to catch what I just said. The Kingdom of Morocco, the Sultan turned king in 1956. He went directly to the General Assembly members of the United Nations and they accepted him as having a state on the record with the General Assembly of the United Nations, even though he didn't have a constitution. Took him six years later by the time he had a constitution. Okay, that must be understood. We'll, we'll learn more about that in the future. I'll tell you more about why I underscore that, because we're talking precedent. We're talking the customs of international law, all right? Let's continue. We're going over law and history. Here's what I need the more to understand while I'm reading. Don't just listen to me reading. What I need you to pay attention to is the due process of law of what's taking place. We're talking about what? Constitutions and states right now. That's what we're reading right now. What, what is the obligation of more? You need to focus in on what these words call government. You need to focus in on what's called ratified deposited. You need to focus in on the word state. You need to focus in on anything that references law. Not divinity law, but what's called the application of law. The sultan went through an application to get his state on the record with the general assembly. But he also needed a constitution. And that was the sultan who turned around and became king still needed a constitution. That's what Moore's got to take away from this right now while we're reading. All right? Let's start from here. The sultan turned king went on to establish an organic independent state known as the Kingdom of Morocco, officially on December 7, 1962, and promulgated on December 14, 1962. Let's pause right there. If I was talking to Kendrick Bay right now, Kendrick Bay, can you tell me the date when your constitution was ratified and deposited? Can you tell me the date when it was promulgated and deposited with the United Nations Charter Secretariat, Article 102. Can Kendrick Bay tell me that? No. Okay, Kendrick Bay, here's the instructions. The Sultan had to do it. Then what makes Kendrick Bay think he doesn't have to do it? In the meantime, Kendrick Bay is what? Stateless, still a Moroccan subject, and also an alien. Let me explain something to the Moors, especially young Moors. Do you realize your straw man, as Kendrick Johnson, has more protections than your Kendrick Bay? I'll say it again. The straw man, Kendrick Johnson, at least comes under civil rights, has a social security number, is on the registrar with the United States, has a birth certificate, and, get, and can go anywhere on planet Earth with an identification card or passport from the United States or one of their several states with a driver's license. Kendrick Johnson has more rights, authorized rights, than Kendrick Bay. Because Kendrick Bay don't exist nowhere on planet Earth on the record of a more state government. That must be understood. Let's start right here. However, it's important to note that the King of Morocco's organic state was accepted by the General Assembly members of the United Nations in December 1956, which is six years before they had a promulgated constitution. So pay attention to the word, promulgated constitution. That's what I need more to focus in on. Just don't listen to it. It's not a nursery rhyme. Pay attention to the words. Impact study sessions about words, forensics, Discernment. Wherefore, the king enacted his own state constitution, state seal, and state flag for his fixed territory within the empire of Morocco. What did we learn from that? More has got to do it too. For each of our states. Continue. Yes, the Empire of Morocco's flag is allegedly in safekeeping 
until the Moore state government elect a competent Moore central state government. What's a central state government? See, when the Moors come back in the statehood of each territory, so we got 50 Moorish state territories, at some point we'll have to elect a central body government that oversees and protects and secures the rights of all 50 of our states. The same way the United States does it from Washington, D.C., that's the same thing more at some point will have a central body government that oversees and protects and secures the rights of our other 50 more states, okay? Let's take it from yes. This is an ANPAC study session. We're studying. Yes, the Empire of Morocco's flag is allegedly in safekeeping until the Moore state governments elect a competent Moore central state government to handle our collective affairs amongst the other competent state communities around the world. So at some point, we'll have a central government. In the meantime, we'll just have our independent states, all right? And if we start to get into alliance, we'll talk about that some more, okay? Question. How do Moors achieve a competent central government and reconvene the Moors empire back into session? Why did I say that sentence? Moors got to reconvene back into session. What happened? The Sultan, what did he do? He adjourned Sinadia in 1956. He left the Moroccan empire vacant of a government. So Moors have to come back into a central government and reconvene and open the government back up of the empire. In the meantime, we need to restore our independent state for now, one state at a time, and then we'll reconvene the central government. Okay, let's continue. Question. How do Moors achieve a competent central government and reconvene the Moorish Empire back into session? What session? Government session. It starts by declaring that the Moors Empire is no longer in a status of adjournment, Sinadia. Question. Who specifically declares that the empire is no longer in a status of adjournment, Sinadia? Answer. The matriarchal legislative branch and the executive branch after they ratify, deposit, and promulgate the central government status with each of the more interdependent states with the United Nations Charter Secretariat, Article 102. Once the ratification, depository, and promulgation are completed, then the United States of Morocco as being one recognized state on behalf of the other interdependent more states can fully execute an application to join the United Nations Charter as a member state. So what would happen? Our central body would then fill out an application because everything's about application. Ain't nothing about just you saying you something. It's about an application and someone must consent. So we'll fill out an application once we now put all our Moroccan states together as a collective, then we'll have one central government that oversees the, the greater interests of all the other more states. That Moroccan, that one more government that oversees all the Moroccan states will now go to the record of the United Nations and say, we want to declare that we have one state called the United States of Morocco. And that one state will be on the record with the United Nations to now go and facilitate negotiations and get into diplomatic relations and constant relations with all the other General Assembly members to look out for the affairs of all the Moors of Northwest of Mexico. That must be understood. Let's start right here. Once, once the ratification, depository, and promulgations are completed, then the United States of Morocco as being one recognized state on behalf of the other inter interdependent more states can fully execute an application to join the United Nations Charter as a member state in similar accordance 
as the Kingdom of Morocco did in December 1956. So remember, the Sultan turned king in 1956. He petitioned, he filled out an application to the General Assembly members of the United Nations, and they accepted his application, and he became a member state in 1956. So the Kingdom of Morocco has been a member state of the United Nations since 1956. Moors have to follow suit. He set the precedent for Moroccan law. Moors have to follow behind that. That's called customary law. We can't do anything that contravenes what the Sultan turned king did on behalf of his Moroccan state and on behalf of what now Moors got to do in order to enforce the Act of Algeciras. Chapter 7, Articles 120 to 123 says we have to do what? Ratification, depository of states, legislation, and we have to give prop we have to promulgate with the United Nations. We're just following instructions. Okay. So right here. However, however, in order to achieve the mission and vision of the state known as the United States of Morocco. We the Moors need to put things in proper sequential order, recognizing that the Moors cannot have a competent central government until we have independent Moorish states. I'll say it again. Recognizing that the Moors cannot have a competent central government until we have independent Moorish states. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? You can't have a central government overseeing states that don't exist. You cannot claim to have a more central government that's not governing over any states. That's out of proper sequential order. We must first have independent states that come together as an alliance that establishes the central government. It can't be the opposite of that. That doesn't make any sense. Let's start all over. Recognizing. Recognizing that the Moors cannot have a competent central government. You see this word right here? Competent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like he used that word, competent. What do we learn about competent? That's the Vienna Convention, 1969, Article 2, tells you what is competent authority. Competent authority is what? Officers of a state. Authorized officers of a state. What kind of state? Organic state. What kind of state? A state that has a constitution. What kind of state? A state's got a constitution that's been ratified and deposited and with the United Nations Charter. Three branches of government. And everybody's been sworn in as authorized officers. Let's continue. How many independent more states does it require to establish a central government of elected officials? That's a good question. The common sense approach would yield the number 13, recognizing that the number 13 is cosmological. Recognizing further that two-thirds vote is nine out of 13. The two-thirds vote of nine states is known as the majority vote out of 13 states. Anywhere from nine to 13 competent Moorish states could draft a treaty and restore the Moorish Empire as being back in session, i.e. formally reconvened forevermore. It's just that simple, Moors. It's just that simple. Listen. Question. What are the steps to, to solidarity, uniformity, and accountability amongst our communities? Okay, here's a bulletin point. Right? Just a thought. Well, we need what? Ratified, deposited more state constitution in each of the territories that define the dominions, i.e., the borders. 
ratified deposit more state flags in each of the territories. We need ratified deposit more state seals in each of the territories. We need competent three branches of government in each of the territories. We need public more state inaugurations in each of the territories. We need competent more state officers in each of the territories. We need to accept ratify and deposit your Morse Constitution with the United Nations Secretary, Article 102, 102. We need to promulgate, i.e. give notice to the corporate state, for example, Texas, the United States of America, and the United States in pursuance to the norms of international law known as uti possibitis juris. Morse got to understand this word right here, uti Possidatus Juris. Make it larger. Uti Possidatus Juris. Moore's got to study this. We're going to look the word up. Here we go. This is a very important word. Moore's got to understand. You're going to learn a lot more about this in international law. It relates to the ICJ and some of the cases that have come out as it, re as it refers to. Uh, International law that refers to Udi Posidatus Juris. Okay? Now let's 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 look at the definition of it. I have it already here. Okay. Starting here. Morris have to promulgate, i.e., give notice to the corporate state, for example, Texas, the United States of America, and the United States in pursuance to the norms of international law known as Uti Posidatus. Juris, meaning Latin for as you possess it under law, is a principle of international law which provides that newly formed sovereign states should retain the internal borders that their preceding dependent area had before their independence. I'll read it again. More than to promulgate i.e. give notice to the corporate state, for example, Texas, United States of America, and the United States in pursuance to the norms of international law, known as Udi Posidatus Juris, meaning Latin for as you possess this under law. So Moors possess under law our states. Then we want to claim the borders, the borders that, that, that they already have, like ADPAC right now is claim international borders of our state. Those new international borders fall under what's called uti possidatus juris in international law. More to learn more about this in the future when I go over classes, all right? There's some international court of justice cases on this, all right? It's already solidified, okay? So, so in the international law, international law known as uti possidatus juris, meaning Latin for as you possess it under law, is a principle of international law which provides that newly formed sovereign states should retain the international borders that their preceding dependent area had before their independence. So the state of Colorado was holding on to a possession of this territory that they call state of Colorado. And in international law, the sovereign under post-millennium per consanguinity can restore the sovereignty of that dominion and reclaim that state and take over those border lines that they had already drawn out on their map. So whatever the United States of America is claiming as their border lines of their corporate states, more can just take over those states as is, and those borders become your new international law borders of who? The sovereign. Let's continue. What else more need to do? Moors have to accept and ratify the 1787, 1836, 1880, and 1906 Moors treaties by enacting a bill with the legislative branch and then ratify the bill into legislation with the executive branch and deposit with the United Nations Secretariat Article 102 of the charter. So you're going to deposit you're going to deposit all these treaties along with your constitution and put it on the record. You're going to promulgate, you're going to deposit with the United Nations, right? Okay, who else are you going to do that with? You send it to the corporate state. 
You're sent to the United States. You're sent to the United States of America, right? You're deposited with them. You're promulgate with them. What does that mean? You're just giving them notice. You're depositing your documentation with them because everything's about applications. It's not about what your mouth said. It's about are you following what? International law. You follow what? The customs of international law. And what is the customs of international law? Your own Moorish treaties. And the instructions are in your own Moorish treaties. Your instructions are not in the Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution of the United States of America was for them to follow the instructions of their Constitution. Continue. Moors have to accept and ratify the United Nations Charter and the ICJ statutes by enacting a bill with the legislative branch and then ratify the bill into legislation with the executive branch and deposit with the United Nations Secretariat Article 102 of the Charter. So you want to now accede to the Charter. You also want to accede to the statutes of the ICJ because you need to understand when you start using that word state, that's, that word state is governed by an HR department called the United Nations. That must be understood. They act as a referee to make sure all the other states around planet Earth play by the rules. Continuing, Moors have to accept and ratify various conventions and declarations from the United Nations General Assembly and the Security Council by enacting a bill with the legislative branch and then ratify the bill into legislation with the executive branch and deposit with the United Nations Secretariat, Article 102 of the Charter. You see, I'm being very redundant. Why? Because these are the instructions. The instructions haven't changed. Where did the United Nations get their instructions? They got it from the Act of Service, 1906, Chapter 7, Articles 120 to 123. Let's continue. Once Morris have done all that ratification, depository, and promulgation, you go right into this. Morris need to do what? Morris need to immediately issue ministerial decrees, i.e. orders, judgments, and opinions from the competent council of court. The competent council of court. The competent council of court. What makes you have a competent, a competent council of court? Your esteem. What makes you have a state? Constitution. What makes your constitution on the record, for the record, and authorized? Your deposit of the United Nations. Once you do that, what happens? Remember, in class 50, we read over the Vienna Convention of 1969, Article 20, Section 5 said what? The United States of America, once they receive notice, they got 12 months to reject or it automatically becomes what? Tacit. It automatically becomes acquiescence. It automatically becomes the new supreme law of the land. So the United States of America knows they can't reject this. They can try, but then they know they can't stop it because they know they cannot supervene the impossibility of performance of Moore's treaties because the instructions are very clear. Let's continue. What else do Moore's have to do? Moors have to become recognized as an organic, competent Moor state by other organic, competent Moor states. And in like manner, your state will recognize the other Moor state. Let's slow down right there. Let's pause. And pack as a state. When another Moor state is on the record, and pack will recognize that other Moor state. And in like manner, that other Moor state will recognize us. We recognize each other. Now we're maintaining the conformity of international law because international law says you don't necessarily have to be recognized. But if you are recognized by another state, that gives you more credibility, you see? So as all the more start to restore the law of restoration, which means you're restoring the Constitution, we'll start recognizing each other one at a time. When we recognize you, you recognize us, and we'll all go on the record together, all right? Let's continue. More need to enact a treaty among the several more states and establish solidarity 
unity and accountability. See, mowers, when we all have our more states, we still need rules and regulations that are going to maintain accountability amongst our more states. That way we make sure we don't have no rogue more states. We need to get mores in place that are all about equality. We need mores in place that understand justice. We need mores in place that understand how to maintain the rules and regulations on behalf of all mores. That's the only way we're going to be able to hold on to our Moorish state governments. Because if we start doing anything that's belligerent, we start doing anything that's contrary to the treaty rights of the United States, and the United States keeps taking us to the ICJ, and more start losing, guess what's going to happen? All the Moors going to lose. Because they're going to say Moors are absolutely incompetent because we're too belligerent and we won't follow the simple instructions. So if more is coming to statehood, we'll put together an alliance, a treaty that maintains the solidarity and the uniformity and the accountability of our Moorish state governments. Let's continue. All right. Right here. At some, at some, at some point, the Moors must vote for our central government officers to represent the empire of Northwest Morocco. Each more state will have a representative that votes for the local politics of the state that they exclusively represent inter alia. Now remember, Moors, I've always told you that all politics is local. All the Moors need to have their own more state governments of each state. Then when we put together the Moors central government, then we'll send one of our representatives to always cast a vote with the more central government, right? So let's read this again. At some point, the Moors must vote for our central government officers to represent the empire of Northwest Morocco. Each Moor state will have a representative that votes for the local politics of the state that they exclusively represent, inter alia. So inter alia, as we all know, means amongst other things, all right? Okay, so obviously, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are just a brief, right? This is not everything more need to know, but these are the basics. Gets us going in the right direction, okay? Now, check this out. Now that we've gone over all this, listen. Question. Was there any above-mentioned enforcement of the municipal law of stare decisis of the United States Supreme Court? The answer is no. What am I saying here in this question? See, everything we just finished reading, did we mention anything about the Constitution of the United States of America's statutes or their articles or their amendments? No. Everything we would know is about what? International law, your Moorish treaties, your Moorish Constitution, and studying and understanding what the Charter expects us to do, because the Charter got their instructions from where? The Act of Albuquerque, 1906, Chapter 7, Articles 120 to 123. Listen, question again. Was there any above-mentioned enforcement of the municipal law of stare decisis of the United States Supreme Court? No. You got more out here constantly talking about, man, you need to go enforce the travel Supreme Court decision that came out about traveling. Wrong concept. You should be enforcing what your more state says about traveling. I'll say it again. What does your Moore state government say? Where's the legislation from your Moore state government that talks about travel? That's what Moore's got to understand. We need legislation of our own states. Listen. Question. Was there any above mentioned enforcement of res judicata of several of the several corporate states? No. Moore's always talking about res judicata and stare decisis. Wrong answer. What did the ICJ tell you to do? Enforce your treaty provisions. But you can't enforce treaty provisions without a state. And you can't have a state without a constitution. Let's continue. Question. Did the ICJ of 1952 inform more to enforce the constitution for the United States of America? Or of the United States of America? You see what I wrote? Listen to what I did. Now, more have been taught to focus on constitution or, or constitution of, irrelevant. So constitution for, 
little you United States of America or of the United States with the you like that, right? You got two small U's, right? So you got Constitution for, or you got Constitution of United States of America, or the United States of America, all caps, or the United States of America in small caps, or the United States of America in all red letters. Did the ICJ turn around and try to figure out what the name was of the United States of America? Were they trying to figure out was the big U, the little U, all small letters? No. You know what they said? I'll show you what they said. When they open up, they put in all caps, United States of America. But when you start to read the ICJ report, France immediately opens up and says United States of America. So what is the ICJ listed as? United States of America, all caps. But when you go in now, you start to read the actual judgment, right? What do they say? United States of America. So if the ICJ is saying they're United States of America, then why are the Moors trying to focus in on whether it's major or minor? What did the ICJ say? The ICJ ratified and recognized and understood we got to keep it simple. What does simple mean? When you spell the United States, it's just simply what? United States of America. Proper noun. That's it. More is overthinking this. Let me tell the more something. When in doubt, pull out your treaties. When you look at the treaties, see how the United States lists their name on the treaties. And you know how they list it? United States of America. It's that simple. So what are you enforcing your treaties? The way they wrote it in the treaties. So I'm going to go to the top. This will make sense to you now. Question. Did the ICJ of 1952 inform more to enforce the Constitution for the United States of America? Or the United States of America? Or the United States of America, all caps? Or the United States of America with little, little caps. Or the United States of America in all red letters. Because more is all focused in on red letters. It's got to be all small. Irrelevant. we got to keep it simple more. When in doubt, pull out your treaties. What does the treaty say? Well, the ICJ told you what the treaty said. United States of America. Big U. Big S. Big A. Keep it simple. Next question. Question. Did the ICJ of 1952 inform the Moors to enforce the Constitution for the United States? Or the United States, all caps? Or the United States written in red letters? No. The ICJ didn't care nothing about that. France didn't care nothing about that. Why didn't they care? Because they said, when in doubt, pull out the treaty. What did the treaty say? The United States of America. Question. Did the ICJ case of France versus the United States of America, 1952, inform the Moors to enforce page 202 of the judgment? Answer, yes. As follows. I'll say the question again. Did the ICJ case of France versus the United States of America, 1952, inform the Moors to enforce page 202 of the judgment? And the answer is yes. What's on page 202 of the judgment? Okay, let's read it. Quote, unquote, in the absence of any treaty provisions dealing with this matter, it has been contended that a right of assent can be based on custom, usage, or practice. It is unnecessary to repeat the reasons which have been given for rejecting custom, usage, and practice as a basis for extended constant jurisdiction and which are largely applicable to the right of assent, quote, unquote. It is, however, necessary to point out that the very large number of instances in which Moroccan laws will refer to the United States authorities can rarely be explained as a convenient way of ensuring their incorporations and ministerial decrees binding upon the consular courts. And in that way, and in that way only, could these laws be made enforceable as against the United States nationals so long as the extended consular jurisdiction was being exercised. And this is what we learned when we were looking at the ICJ report 
page 202, right? We went over this over and over and over again. That the ICJ clearly told all the board that the Constitution of the United States of America is not the answer to the test. The answer to the test is in your Moroccan treaties. And if we don't understand that right now your Moroccan treaties is allowing the United States of America to hold on to you as a Moroccan subject, then we're, con we're going to continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Now, as I wrap up and I close, I'm going to say it again. Kendrick Bay is an alien. Kendrick Bay is stateless. Kendrick Bay does not exist nowhere on planet Earth on the record of a Moorish state government. However, if Kendrick Bay wants to now return to Morocco according to its treaty provisions and consent to a Moroccan government, how do you consent? Through an application to the Moorish state government. And that government must be competent. And what makes them competent? Because they're the authority of that state. And what makes you a state? Your constitution. And what makes your constitution authorized? Ratification depository of the United Nations Secretary General, Article 102. I am with that. Islam.